All right. So uh, again, a lot of this is conceptual. So this is going to be how game phases and game states, as well as leads, change objectives, fights, and uh, farm. So we're going to mostly be going over the different game states uh, and the different like phases, let's call them, of the game and how differences in these and approaching these um, change how your team farms, how you are able to farm as a person. Uh, maybe like lightly touch on the differences between ranked and competitive and uh, what you should be doing in these different states. So uh, largely we can separate the game into three different phases. There is the early game, which we can also call the laning phase, but for the purposes of this talk, I will be separating the two. So there are the initial waves slash early game, which would be levels one through three, the laning phase, which would be levels three through nine, the mid game, which is going to be around level nine to 15, and the late game, which is going to be around 16 to 20. So the reason I'm separating the initial waves in early game right now is because the level one to two power spike is one of the most important like fight starters, especially in duo and mid jungle, and sometimes in jungle solo. Uh, and level three also dictates how well you farm objectives, especially neutral objectives uh, around duo, uh, oracles, mid camps, etc. So for purposes of this, we're just calling it a completely separate state of game. So what I mean by the level one to two power spike being incredibly strong is when you have lane priority or lane control in mid jungle, in duo, in jungle solo, and you hit level two before the enemy, that is an entire form of CC, an entire other source of damage. You are effectively like doubling their resource pool, right? It's not like it's not going from just one to one to two and then not doing anything else out of it. It's going from one to two and saying, all right. We have CC that they don't, they can't contest it. So that's why you look to start fights level one to two. Um, level three, again, you also have like a third resource. The spike usually isn't as great unless you're a character like Terra, which needs like all three of your, uh, of your like your normal kit to do anything uh, or to do most things rather. So the level three spike isn't as prevalent, but you still have more resources in your tool belt for contesting neutral objectives. And then that leads into the further laning phase, which is levels three to three to nine which is largely what uh what mid and solo kind of breeze into especially now that the jungle pathing has changed and mid is not consistently in danger level one to two um so three to nine is where you see like most of the game being like played normally uh, a lot of neutral play in this game especially at the higher levels because you're not going to see like a huge snowball happen uh this is where characters get their alts this is where you start identifying uh, what game state you're in based on the comp and based on how the initial waves have gone. And this is where you see some early ganks, some objective burns or some um, some active burns. And how you transition into the mid game is, and the game state you're going to be going into the mid game is entirely dependent on how well you play the laning phase. So mid game being levels 9 through 15, a lot of characters get their power spikes level 9, level 11. This is when you have around two points in your alt and you're finishing your uh, your first like big burst skill. And because of this, certain characters just fly through the roof in terms of damage potential. Uh, perfect example, like a really basic one is Scylla, right? Scylla has a passive that gives her bonus power every single time she finishes leveling an ability. Uh, you hold the point, I believe it's level eight. Level nine, you finish your two and you put a point in your alt. So now that's a fully stacked uh, level on her two. Uh, one stack on her passive and two points in her alt. So her burst potential increases by like a good chunk of percent. And that's incredibly good for like objective fighting and stuff. So essentially put, uh, you want to keep your eyes on these power spikes going from the laning phase into the mid game. So you have a better grip on what you're able to do versus your opponent. And the late game is really self-explanatory. You have already identified the game state. You have already identified where you're at, what the power spikes are, what they have been and how your opponent is going to play around objectives. So now that we've talked about the phases of the game, we're going to go into the game states, which are only three. There is advantage, neutral, and disadvantage. Advantage state is when you are considerably ahead, ahead enough to really take fights without risk, steal farm, and just get out. And that's really it. There is neutral state, which is what the majority of games are played at, uh, when you're neutral, you're mostly just controlling neutral camps or looking to control neutral camps. These would be your scorpions, your mid camps, your mid harpies, your oracles, the side camp on the uh, on the dual lane side. Uh, 
the contestion of these neutral camps is really what defines neutral game state and whether it moves into advantage or disadvantage. And then disadvantage state in which you are already behind and you're playing defense on your own objectives because the opponent is, of course, an advantage state. So what do you want to do in each of these game states, right? And the answer is for advantage, really simple. Run and kill. Like you want to just get in the enemy jungle. You want to control as much of the map as possible. You want to control objectives. You want to position yourself in a way that denies the most space possible. And that's really the, the key factor of like playing advantage state. It's not about killing the enemy players, truthfully. Uh, killing them is good. Like it's great. You get a little bit of a gold injection. You get some XP. You stop them from farming. It's awesome. But the real value is if we're going to go to the map for a second and put this in yellow. That's a really important ideal. The real value of denying space is let's say we are in advantage state on order side. Right. So we have a three point play moving from mid to the red buff. Right. Now, if we control this red buff on the next respawn, we know when they're going to go over there to defend it. So not only do we have the knowledge that the people are going to come over to defend this buff. We also have the ability to pivot that fight and take this and take this and take this. And now all three of these are owned by order side. Right. So the value isn't necessarily in killing the players. The value is in controlling the space. Because when you control something as pivotal as this that is denying XP consistently, the bleed is happening over here and over here and very likely over here as well. So that's why like red buff invades, especially in the laning phase and the early mid game, are very, very important. The same can be said for junglers with stealing these. But considering they don't give like any, con like, any huge buff, they're not as impactful and the respawn timer on these is so so quick compared to something like the red buff where you're very likely not going to be there for every respawn because then you're opening the opportunity for dual lane to get ganked but that's a bit more advanced um generally speaking advantage state is just going from here to here and getting the most out of your time and the most space as possible and that's why uh it's important as well to understand the value of your towers. So when it comes to game states and setting an advantage state, one of the easiest ways to set advantage state in terms of opening up the map is destroying the mid tower early. And usually, uh, in solo especially, you do not want to destroy towers early. And that is because if you are in advantage state and this tower stays up, you are forcing the enemy laner that is behind you in XP and gold to stay around here. So this is a very free gank from both sides. You can have support move up front, jungle move from the back, and solo lane moves up over here. There are many ways to go about this, but usually the tower gold injection isn't really of value in somewhere like in solo. However, in mid, let's say we take this tower, the opening to go to something like the red buff is way easier because now we have two entry points in there without getting hit by a tower. It's the same thing for the back camps. It's the same thing for the scorpion. Like you have a lot of, you have a lot more avenues to make plays and you have a lot more space to do things like ward over here, see if they're pathing like through red, ward over here, see if they're pathing through backs, ward the scorp. Uh, taking this mid tower is usually the, uh, the optimal play in advantage state in order to open up the rest of the map. However, um, it's become harder to do that, especially with supports building stuff like, uh, like that emperor's armor and uh the amount of like defense put up in mid because of early support rotations um now moving into neutral state neutral is really self-explanatory because it's really predicated by one two three four these two kind of and then these kind of right like this line right here is where the majority of the neutral xp is coming from and as long as you can control that as like mid jungle, you should be fine. And that like these stack up so hard because they like give a decent chunk of XP. And again, they come up relatively often. So as they as they chunk up and as both mid laners take their waves like back and forth, the mid laner that's not getting these XP is just very slowly falling behind. And that's what we call the bleed. So the bleed is a concept that uh, I use a lot. When it comes to uh when it comes to mobas this applies like all mobas like can, you can easily apply it to league as well um but the bleed is when a game seems very very neutral 
and nothing is happening. I mean, like, nobody's fighting, ganks are all failing, everybody's playing super safe, but there's one team that is getting these neutral camps consistently. And it doesn't just have to be these, it can also be these, it can be Scepter, it can be this one, it can be these. As long as one team has full control over like both sides of the XP, that bleed starts. And then that's one character or two characters that is just continuously snowballing XP over the course of 5, 10, 15 minutes that then just ends up with a three or four level lead and changes the fight based on that. So the bleed is a, is largely contained in the neutral game state, but it leads into advantage state. Disadvantage state, of course, is playing defense. So disadvantage state is, let's say your mid tower is taken and then red buff is getting invaded. So that means you guys have to play all over here and like organize fights around this red buff, cut off path to escape and look to like defend this. Because if you stop this bleeding, then it's going to be harder for them to do it a second time and a third time and a fourth time. Disadvantage state is when your towers are already down, you're on the back foot. It can be anywhere from 2k to 5k to 7k to 10k down. What disadvantage truthfully means is you are not in control of your side of the map largely. You are not able to, pay, to take the fights that you want to and are largely looking for the enemy team to mess up or for an opportunity to get a pick to put yourself back in neutral state. Now, disadvantage state, especially in a game like Smite at the higher levels, is very, very hard to come out of because of the nature of a lot of characters having bloated kits. Um, it's way harder, way, way, way harder to pick somebody that knows what they're doing and has their actives up, which is why a disadvantage state is largely predicated by the team fights that happen over buff defense. And if you are losing three red buffs and don't take those team fights, that's just like you're kind of just washed at that point and you're waiting on objective steals or gold furies or anything else but disadvantage state truthfully is uh is only really rectified by at the end of the game phoenix fights largely a second phoenix fight um could be a titan fight but it's largely going to be a second phoenix fight after the first push like ends up uh burning ultimates so Again, you just don't want to end up in disadvantage state for as long as possible. And you can prevent that by drafting well. And that's where like draft really comes in handy for things like this. Um, some comps are very, very hard to push into disadvantage state comparatively to others. So this is like an example of why good drafting is like imperative. Because if you have something like a Vulcan, right? Vulcan has an incredibly high damage output. He's a lot safer now, but he still requires a good chunk of peel. And then you have an entire team that dives in front of him and like allows him to free cast, but ends up in disadvantage. So let's say you have Thanatos jungle, Fenrir support, and then like whatever, whatever solo, it doesn't really matter with a Vulcan mid and an ADC that's going to be firing from the back line. Now, if that team ends up in disadvantage state because Fenrir like botched laning phase and Thanatos got invaded early, that Vulcan's a sitting duck. That now this guy is not playing his character. He's not playing into the comp. This one and this one have already like threw the ball. Like they 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 botched it. So what happens then is the comp falls apart and now you are left to only defend with an aggressive comp because it was way easier to push you into disadvantage, which is why a lot of the times you don't draft very aggressively early and why you look to uh, to really balance out a team comp with both front and backline CC. Uh, we're in a meta right now that favors like heavy semi-global, um, that also favors very heavy like backline CC. It allows a lot of like tankier warriors and stuff to be enabled to dive but in reality, it's mostly playing back to front from your mid forward and ensuring that all your damage is getting off in time versus like only diving and scattering your damage. So when you have a comp that is able to play from a, from a safe spot and push their advantage slowly throughout the game, you are it's way harder to put you into a disadvantage state than it is to uh, kick you out of like an advantage state. Um, truthfully, 
that's like the, that's the crux of uh, of this talk is really just like not only are there three different states that you have to identify at each phase of the game which would be early game landing phase mid game and late game um you want to just figure out a plan of what what is our big fight if we're in disadvantage state what is the big fight that we can take that will take us out of disadvantage what will allow us to get our entire map control back what will give us the agency to move throughout the jungle and start considering neutral farm again what will be that one game changing play or those two game changing plays who can we pick to make the journey from red buff to oracles to gold fury safer that's how you that's how you start ideating out of disadvantage state neutral state is essentially just how do we leverage our lead that we're gaining from these neutral camps to push an advantage state which normally is we have the big fat mid laner walk up at the jungle and then boom to red buff start a fight there have support rotate over largely from early and once support hits level five a huge cc ult along with a mage ult is typically what uh what ends them right so it's transitioning from one to the other to the other and from advantage state is how can we make the enemy team as miserable as possible how can we push this advantage and deny enough space where they're like effectively not playing the game how do we position ourselves to always be here and always death ball and kill them where do we start sticking wards to understand where they're going to come from and how we're going to kill them so uh any questions after that it's again largely the uh the crux of this lecture or whatever it was uh i would like to add something really fast mm -hmm. yeah before um, so a lot of people i'm assuming would think that advantage or disadvantage state is referring to the gold lead or the xp lead and it is not it is referring to a team's ability to control the map and a team's ability to fight this includes mm -hmm. things like relics dead players uh even team comps if you're swinging early game you're going to like if you've got like thanatos and like a safe fast clear in mid and high pressure support like atlas you're automatically going to start the game in an advantage state if the other team can't fight into that so it has to do with comp it has to do with relics it has to do with ultimates um it can even be something as small as your jungle having better camp timers than the other jungle and you have a better like time advantage to get to your camps versus theirs so it is not just a gold lead even though that is one of the ways that you can become advantaged or disadvantaged no absolutely uh the states of the game like matter most based on like ability to get to here right like these corners of the map how do we deny this how do we like take advantage um and again like like uh friend said this is like most mostly uh, especially in lower levels players will see gold lead and be like yep that's it like that's all we need right um but later on you start realizing it's not just gold it's relics it's ultimates it's who's up and why it is who like which gods characteristically win a 2v2 if we were to take it like understanding your matchups and then capitalizing on that matchup understanding like hey i have my alt up where i'm gonna start jumping from here i'm gonna like floor all from here all the way back here so like i need follow-up support starts walking over because they were already invading this purple sets up that fight right so that's because you were an advantage state if they didn't have their alts they didn't have their relics they can't turn that to 2v1 as well because they're walking back to the lane and you just you literally just kill them um and again yeah that, it's a very good way to put it it's just it's largely about space in my eyes it's about how well you can control your space how well you control the enemy space uh but again it bleeds into matchups relics what abilities are up or down uh what objectives are up that you're leveraging to pivot to after this engagement right there is a lot that goes into it but for the lower levels think of it mostly as gold and space until you are, are, are able to start tracking those uh those more intricate factors uh also add one more thing for the higher levels is um waves if you oh, wave clear, priority yeah if you clear your mid wave before the other mid does you have and you have like the ability to walk to their red buff then if they even contest you they've lost farm off of going to contest you even if they get that red buff they've lost farm because a red buff is not worth a full wave of minions walking into your tower and dying 
that's that's a really same thing good point. in solo same thing in duo it's this is a, a concept that exists more in League of Legends that hasn't really translated to Smite play, uh, even after like years and years and years, and it's called lane priority, right? So lane priority is a lot less prevalent in Smite. It's a lot harder to see because we usually work in binaries of the lane. Is, we have cleared all the minions and the lane is clear and the, the minions are walking or we are waiting to clear minions because we have not cleared them yet. Um, in League, of course, there's like last hitting and like setting and then like crashing waves and whatnot. So lane priority in Smite is effectively like, I cleared my wave, therefore this entire space is now mine because there are no enemy minions, which means I have free reign to walk over here, to walk over here, here, and here, like, etc. Same thing in duo. Like if you clear way before them, you can just walk to purple real safely. Uh, you can also walk to ganks and rotate to fights a lot easier because you're not caught up on like missing that XP because you've already claimed it. Um, it's there are intricacies when it comes to like setting waves later in the game, Oni waves and like yada, 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 the whole nine. But effectively, it's if wave is cleared, you're free to do stuff because you're not missing XP. Can I say one thing? Shoot. Um, just also be careful. Like if you clear lane and then you're like, oh, yeah, uh, I just cleared lane really fast. I'm going to go over to his blue and you like have everything down. They can still kill you. Like if they, they can still technically ignore lane if you have everything down and just like wall of you, depending on the circumstances. So don't just like blindly go for everything, even though you have lane pressure. That goes double yeah. for supports. Do not use your primary CC abilities on a wave just to clear it faster. You want to always have the ability to fight, the ability to peel, or the ability to get out as a support. Uh, in every role, actually, in every role, you want to have the ability to fight, peel, or get out. Pretty much no matter what, sometimes it just comes from relics or positioning. Other times, especially for support, it does have to come from your primary CC abilities or your damage. 100%. 100%. Uh, a really good rule of thumb is, depending on your character, of course, but largely don't show your hands when you're clearing wave. Don't, like, don't burn a jump. Don't burn a CC ability unless it has like a three second cooldown or something like reasonable. Uh, don't burn an escape. Don't like throw Scylla Sentinel in there just because you can. Don't throw Scylla Sentinel to run to the enemy red buff unless you're like getting backed up by three people. Just don't show off that like your kid is up or down. If it's down, don't make the aggressive play. But if it's up, then you can at least position a bit more aggressively. So just don't use your jumps like a dummy after like don't use a jump to clear wave and then walk into the jungle. 